I'm joined right now by one of our mission controllers here in Houston, uh, ISS Ground Controller Bill Foster. Bill, thank you so much for being here with me today. Well, thank you for having me, Dan. It's a real honor. Uh, I've heard you called an ICOT of mission control, and I know that GC, you guys are kind of the gatekeepers to everything that goes on here. So why don't you tell me, you know, how did you get that title? Okay, well, the ground control is, just like you said, it's the, the gatekeeper. We're the, the representative to the flight director for all the functioning of the mission control center and for the network. So we work with people within the building, our engineering support, maintenance support, uh, backroom operations people to control the data flow through the building, make sure the equipment's up, running, to, uh, everything from the, the front-end processors to the uh, bathrooms. You know, We're responsible to make sure the entire building is working properly. Uh, we also work with people at the network, at Goddard Space Flight Center, the, um, White Sands Complex, uh, some of the ground stations around the country to ensure that we have data flowing uh, through the space network, the TDRA satellites, so that we can communicate with the space station or other spacecraft and um, you know, make sure everything is working properly. Okay, and I mean, that's, that's something that a lot of people don't always recognize, where it's not just, you know, the people in this room are not the only part of mission control. There are people in back rooms all over this building and other centers, you know, other states, even, even other countries, and you're kind of tying them all together. That's correct. Uh, last two nights I've been working at the ground control console in this room, and we're dealing with people in, in uh, Germany, in Moscow, in uh, Japan, uh, the Canadian Space Agency, we're, we're dealing with people all over. we got the Marshall Space Flight Center, which is our primary payload operations center for all the science that goes on with the space station. So yeah, if they have a problem with anything dealing with getting data to them, then it's our responsibility as the ground controllers to coordinate whatever effort is necessary to resolve that problem. And I know you guys have a really integral role in actually the, the, the communication between the people here on the ground and uh, everyone up in space. You guys are kind of, you know, holding all the keys to who gets to uh, talk to the astronauts while they're up there. You have to do all the communication flips and things like that. Talk a little bit about that. That's correct. We have one of our backroom positions known as the Houston ComTech controls the space to ground loops that let us talk to the crew. Uh, if we need to set up for a private medical conference or family conference, then it's our ComTech that coordinates with the, the uh, medical people in, in terms of getting the right phone calls patched in and then at the time that the conference starts moving it into a private area so that the only people to hearing that are the two parties involved the, the medical or the family and the crew. Uh, we also secure the space to grounds when the crew goes to sleep so we don't inadvertently send something up to them and, and wake them up. That's never a popular thing to do. Although I remember several years ago uh, we were doing some testing in here, and I actually did set a, a test message up during crew sleep. Uh, you get some attention when you do oh, that. Say, I bet they weren't too happy. Oh, no. <laughs> okay, well, um, that kind of covers our day-to-day. -day. Now, uh, as a GC, you're kind of integral in the role of uh, not only maintaining, but also, you know, looking ahead towards the future. And I understand you're getting uh, heavily involved with Mission Control's role in the upcoming Orion test flight EFT-1. That's correct. Um, you know, b before shuttle ended, I, I spent most of my time down there working launch and landing for the, the last 13, 14 years for all the space shuttle missions. And now that it's retired, the, the room that we used to support shuttle from is being primarily used for testing, but it will come back into a mission support mode in 2014 when we do the EFT-1 flight. Uh, right now we're working with uh, Lockheed Martin out of Denver who is the, co the uh, company that's building the Orion capsule. And they're, they're managing all of the, the flights for NASA. Uh, EFT-1 is, um, again, we think gonna go up in the April 2014 timeframe. Uh, eventually Orion will launch on the new space launch system, the SLS that NASA's building, but for this flight, they're um, buying the services from uh, United Launch Associations Delta IV out of Cape Canaveral. So it'll launch on a Delta IV. It'll make two orbits of the Earth. On the second orbit, it will, um, for its reentry burn, it will actually go up into a highly elliptical orbit going up to about 3,600 miles. 
and this is the farthest we've sent anything intended for human, you know, occupation since the the, the days of Apollo. That's correct. The so. last time we had people up that high, and of course there won't be there will not be people on this particular mission, but the last time we've sent a spacecraft designed for humans up that high was the Apollo uh, 17 mission, and the reason we're sending it up that high is so that when it re-enters, it's coming in. It'll be coming in at about. 20,000 miles an hour, not quite the Apollo speeds, but close enough that we can get a good test of the heat shield and control of the capsule to make sure that uh, the design is correct. And those speeds are something they experience when you do go out much further. And That's I correct. Mean, when you're just in low Earth orbit, they come in at about 17,500. So coming back from the moon, you're going well over 20,000 miles right, an hour. Right, around 25,000 miles when you're coming back from the moon. So it's 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 close. It's closer than what you experienced, you know, from low Earth orbit. Okay, well, why don't you tell me a little bit about what you guys are doing uh, to to prepare for this test flight and kind of, uh, I mean, you, you mentioned that the old shuttle mission control room is kind of being converted over for testing and it's going to be used for this flight. What's actually going to be happening in that room? What kind of data are you guys going to be tracking from there? And, you know, what's your role going to be? Okay, um, for, for EFT-1, we're, there's a couple of things going on. One, we're trying to do it at the lowest cost possible because there, there's not a lot of budget right now. So we're going to be using many of the same systems we use to support shuttle. Uh, we are using a different front-end processor, a, a commercial application from Harris Corporation called Comet. So one of the things the GCs are doing is we're trying to understand how to operate that. It's, it's different from what we've done in the past. And we're holding weekly data flows in the white ficker, the, the white flight control room, which is the old shuttle room, where we're basically just trying to learn how to operate the system, how to flow data, how to run simulations. As we get a little bit closer to the mission, we're going to be doing end-to-end -end testing with um, an Orion test rig up in Denver, also with the Orion capsule when it moves to KSC. It'll be in the operation and checkout building for several months, and we'll flow data between that and here. So, you know, basically just coming up to speed on what we need to do, and the rest of the flight control team that'll be supporting are, are developing displays. So while we're flowing data into the, the new system, they can be down in the room building displays so that they can, you know, have the right insight into the vehicle during the test. Okay, we just showed a few a few views that you were just seeing now. Uh, we're in that old shuttle mission control, the White Ficker, as it's known around here. And uh, are they running kind of a simulation today? I mean, up on the screen, you can see kind of models of uh, uh, of that EFT-1 launch vehicle. That's correct. Uh, we we do have that running now. The 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 models or the the, the graphics up there are not in sync with the data. Uh, but we like to put that up just to give a little bit of a flavor of what we're doing. And the more familiar we are with what the mission profile is, then the better we're going to be able to support it. Uh, the data we're flowing today is from a, a simulator uh, that's built into the workstations that basically just generates the basic onboard status during different mission phases. Okay. Uh, well, then, aside from, you know, all these upgrades being done to the white picker, I know that uh, Mish Control is kind of in a 21st century revolutionary stage right now where you guys are looking to kind of, you know, upgrade everything that, we're, that we're operating on. I mean, I know recently in this room we just got our new uh, device systems, so replacing some of the old uh, Divas, which, I mean, how long have we been using the Divas? Uh, Divas, uh, that's the digital voice interface subsystem. It came on the floor in 1993 originally. It replaced the old Viz system, uh, voice interface subsystem, which was hard push buttons and a rotary dial phone, which is it's kind of funny when tourists come in here because up on the third floor of the building, we, we have preserved the Apollo control room. And in that room, we have the old Viz key sets in. Mm -hmm. So when, when kids come through there, they look at this round thing with holes in it and have no clue what it's for. <laughs> And then once you explain it to them, it, it's funny just saying, you know, go ahead, try and dial your phone number. And after about three or four numbers, they get fed up and quit. <laughs> but, yeah, so Divas came in in 1993. It was originally designed to last about seven to ten years. Uh, we've gone way beyond that time frame. Um, the device, digital voice, interface, communication equipment, I think, is what that stands for. Um, 
has been on the drawing boards for many years. It's it's a commercial product as opposed to Divas, which was uh, custom designed and built by Ford Aerospace back when they controlled the, the uh, control center. Um, but uh, it's almost completely integrated into the building now. We're still pulling out a few old Divas key sets and installing some device key sets in some of the back rooms that aren't currently being used. But as far as all the operational areas, mm -hmm. uh, we, we've moved over to device. So it's it's interesting getting used to it. Its characteristics are a little bit different than the Diva. So uh, we're all going through growing pains with that. But mm -hmm. it's, it offers a lot of capability. But yeah, but again, we're, we're upgrading, you know, we're, we're, upgrading. we're moving on to new technology. What are some of the other, you know, 21st century innovations you guys are going to be looking to implement down the road? Yeah, the, the, the buzzword going on within Mission Operations Directed is the 21 projects. We have MCC 21, Training Systems 21, and User Apps 21, all integrated together to give us a framework to move into the future programs uh, at lower cost, uh, more capability, a lot more automation. Uh, right now, the original ISS control room down the hall from here has been outfitted with new consoles, new displays, and they're using that as a prototype environment to work up where we're going from here. It's, it's going to be a, another couple of years before it's fully integrated within mm -hmm. the building. But when we get there, we're going to have various front room control facilities, such as this room, the, the flight control room number one that ISS runs out of, uh, the white ficker and uh, the blue ficker, blue flight control room, which is the old ISS room. We're also going to build in what were some of our back room areas, we're going to build what we call operation suites, which are like smaller versions of a control room. And we're going to make all this available not only for NASA programs supporting with the Orion program and, and other projects that come up, but also make it available for commercial customers to come in and, and use the facilities. So it's it's a it's a sort of a bold initiative that's going on, and I think if I heard right, uh, y'all are going to be covering some of that in the in the near future, showing some of the consoles and I things. I believe we are planning on showcasing some. I mean, it, it is really exciting work anytime we get to you know, show off whatever new systems are controlling our spacecraft. Yes. And, and I mean, that's what this room's doing. And now, Bill, again, as as a GC, you, you've been exposed to a lot of the different, not only the systems, but also the culture here inside yeah. of Mission Control. Yeah, the, the culture in the in the MCC is something that's that's very unique. The, the way we do business, the way we train, um, the, the hours that we put in is something that you don't see in a lot of places. Um, if you look around the room, you'll see a lot of plaques on the wall, uh, the whole tradition of hanging the plaques and, and what that means is part of the culture. You, you walk into the Apollo control room and, you know, you can just feel the history that's there. You can, you can almost still see the smoke hanging from the ceiling you know, back when they used to smoke here. And, and they used a, we used a system called of, of pneumatic tubes to move paperwork around. And that was part of the, the, the 1960s email, right? You bet. If you wanted to print out, you pushed a button on your console, it went to a printer in another part of the building, and about two minutes later, it popped up at your console in a, in a P-tube. So kind of an interesting thing. Now, one of the big cultural aspects of this is, is our flight directors. From the very beginning with Chris Kraft, they picked names for their teams, and Chris Kraft was known as Red Flight. He had the red team. Um, Gene Kranz became White Flight, uh, you know, from Apollo 13 fame. If you saw the movie and you saw him in his white vest, you know, he, he always wore the colors of his team. Uh, John Hodge was Blue Flight. Those were the first three flight directors. And as others came online, uh, Glenn Lunny was Black Flight, and um, they eventually ran out of useful colors to do, so they, they started picking either constellations or just something that was symbolic to what they are. And a few years ago, uh, working with them, I started designing some emblems to go along with their team names and uh, have gotten to the point where I've got pretty much a emblem design for all the active flight directors and even a few of the uh, past ones. Yeah, I think you may have some that you can show for. Yeah, I think we do. We have uh, Atlas Flight okay. here. Yeah, Atlas Flight is Paul Hill. He's the head of the mission operations the directorate right now. And he wanted his emblem to look a lot like the MOD emblem. <coughs> Excuse me. 
um, so that was that was a fun one to build. Had had a lot of help from uh, Mike Akuda, a friend of mine that used to work at Star Trek, in getting that one designed. Carbon Flight and Van Sys, um, the, that was a fun one to work on, coming up with the sort of the carbon ball type background, and then he the wording around the the side toughness competence vigilance discipline are all part of the the culture of the flight control team uh, eagle flight john mccullough up until the last week or so was the head of the flight director office as he's moved on to other assignments here at jsc um, now black flight this is uh, glenn lunny yeah, this this were a fun two to work on this one and the next one onyx flight uh, Onyx Flight is Brian Lunny, which was Glenn's son, the first and only right now father-son flight director that's been out there. But Glenn supported the Apollo missions, and um, Brian, until the time that he left NASA, was supporting the uh, shuttle ascent. So I got to work with him quite a bit. Okay, well, uh, so you know, <laughs> like you said, you've had kind of a direct role in designing a lot of those patches. Yeah, it's yeah. it's been fun doing that. Um, I got involved with designing a little bit after the Columbia accident. When sitting on console during the investigation, you had a lot of time on your hands as a GC because we weren't necessarily actively doing stuff. We were more mm -hmm. the gatekeepers of the data that got handed out. And I came up with the idea of designing a, an emblem to represent all of the crews that we've lost in space. And uh, that's where Mike Akuda really came in very handy. He, uh, helped with that quite a bit and then I would give him some concepts and he would send back uh, pretty quickly a lot of uh, neat designs on that and eventually that became the <coughs> Space Flight Memorial Emblem which is hanging in the room right now. Okay well again Bill Foster, GC Gatekeeper Mission Control and Icon as well. I want to really thank you for giving us an inside look to everything it is that you guys do workings of this room and what we have to look forward to. Thanks for being here today. Well, I appreciate you having me. Thank you, Dan. It's a great pleasure. Okay.